this week on One Devotion. Meet a fearsome figure on the court who's a gentle giant off it. Relive the miracle run of the penultimate EuroLeague title winners. Hear how one star newcomer learned the ropes from Dream Teamers. And marvel at the high points in another dramatic week of action. When your profession is banging with the biggest bodies in the EuroLeague all the time, it helps to look the part. Panathinaikos Athens centre Miroslav Radulica not only talks the talk, but walks the walk with his tattoos, beard and game face. He also walks the walk as the top scorer and third best rebounder on the greens. Since I was a kid, I, I always wanted to have something on my face. I couldn't wait to grow my, my hair on the face so I could, you know, have a beard or mustaches or something. And it's similar with the tattoos also because uh, when I was a teenager, I think that, that came to me that I'm going to have a tattoos, you know, both sleeves one day. So I just waited for the right time. One look at him and it comes as no surprise to learn that Radulica has a personal tattoo artist, likes motorcycles and gets pumped up before games by listening to heavy metal. But he doesn't do it to intimidate opponents. I wouldn't say so because uh, it's sometimes good that your opponents underestimate you. Standing next to the 2 metre 13 big man on the court, no one would dare underestimate him. But off the court, Radulica is anything but intimidating. A lot of people, when they see me like this, you know, they think I'm, you know, I, they cannot talk to me or I'm like this or that. That's just prejudgments based on an outside look. Radulica likes history, reads a lot, speaks or understands five different languages and is very much a gentle giant who is quick to help people, mostly children, who need it. I like to help uh, people, that's just the way how I taught through my family. Basketball gave me so much and why wouldn't I give something back, you know, to people that are less fortunate or, you know, they just need help. I'm somehow always involved uh, in that stuff. It just, I'm not finding them. I would say they, they find me, but not like in person, they're asking for help. They, uh, most of the time they're too proud to ask for help. Sometimes I hear about it through my friends or on the uh, internet or whatever, and I just jump in and try to do whatever I can. Once in Athens, Radulica plunged quickly into community service as the new one-team ambassador for Panathinaikos, debuting in that role while Panathinaikos was on the EuroLeague Asian Tour. Basketball gave us a lot, all of, all of the players who play in EuroLeague, no matter, everywhere. So I think it's our duty or need to give something back and the best way is to helping community or disadvantaged kids or, you know, just people who are less fortunate. It's not only Radulica who helps the kids, however, they also help him keep perspective. It just gets you in a right state of mind. If you, uh, in some point of your life, if you think you got somewhere or, you know, want something, all this medals and, you know, awards and, and stuff and you see the kids, you know, disadvantaged kids, and that just brings you down a little bit and makes you more humble, I think. The commitments that professional athletes make to community projects can change people's lives, and the rewards for athletes like Radulica are often priceless. When you see you, you, you're the one, or, you know, your effort is the, the one who, that make them smile, you know, it's just very emotional and very special. And if some of the smallest kids he meets do a double take when Radulica walks into the room, their apprehension is soon history. A lot of people are frightened, but like I said, it's just only my, my outside look. And when we make a connection and start talking or doing some things, you know, they just relax and then uh, they smile.
Despite winning 12 of its first 14 games, Maccabi Tel Aviv in early 2014 was still not considered a favourite for the EuroLeague title. The team was very much a working progress, with eight new players like Alex Tyus and Tyrese Rice still finding their places in head coach David Blatt's system. Well, me and Tyrese, we spoke uh, with each other when we weren't playing as much early in the season. We were trying to figure out what we could do to, uh, you know, get more playing time and to help the team win. And we just mainly practiced hard, uh, came ready to play every day, and we knew that if our time came, we would take advantage of it, and, and we got the opportunity, and we made the most of it. Their most was desperately needed as Maccabi limped into the playoffs and found itself behind by 12 points with two minutes left in game one on the road in Milan. But that's when the seeds of a miracle were sown as Rice and Ricky Hickman split 27 points in seven minutes through overtime as Maccabi stole home court advantage. We understood that you know, we was going to fight for each other all the way up until the last second, you know, no matter what the situation was. Maccabi would win their series 3-1 as Tyus was named the MVP of the month that included the playoffs. But avoiding Game 5 in Milan merely postponed a trip back to Mediolanum Forum, where the Final Four took place a few weeks later. It would prove to be a charmed destination for the men in yellow. In the semi-final against favoured Seska Moscow, Maccabi was behind by 15 points with 11 minutes to play, and by four still with 20 seconds left on the clock. After David Blue buried a three-pointer, the game's closing seconds became branded in the collective memory of all Maccabi fans. We've had a lot of uh, things go our way that Final Four and uh, taking advantage of it, I think that was the biggest thing. You know, sometimes teams are given chances, but we, we took it. Obviously, the Cesar game was very close um, and Tyrese made a, a, a big layup at the end and we were able to capitalize on their mistake. I never look at anything individually. It could have been anybody on our team that done, that did what, what I did also, and I would have felt the same way. In the championship game, Maccabi met Real Madrid, which had beaten arch-rival FC Barcelona two nights earlier by the biggest semi-final margin in Final Four history, 38 points. But on Sunday, Maccabi refused to let Madrid escape. Neither team could lead by more than five points in the entire second half. So it was no surprise to see the continental title game go to overtime for the first time in 35 years. At that point, however, the momentum had shifted to the underdog, Maccabi, thanks in large part to its fans having sensed a miracle in progress and flocked to Milan to fill the arena. It helped us a lot. Uh, it was unbelievable. We had pretty much the entire arena was in yellow. Even the city in Milano was in yellow. And uh, I think that was one of the kind of like the sixth man for us. We felt like no matter the situation with all those people behind us that we couldn't lose. Like, you know, they were giving us constant support, you know, the whole time. You know, obviously down 15 in the Cheska game. You know, they're still jumping around crazy and giving us all the support we needed. And I think, you know, without them, then we probably wouldn't have won the championship. Indeed, overtime was a party painted completely yellow. Rice scored eight of his team's first 10 points and assisted Tyus's dunk for the other two. After that, Maccabi was ahead and never looked back, scoring 25 points total in five minutes to finally defeat Madrid by 12. The Madrid game, we just kind of came in there and just took the game and we played with them from the beginning. And I think that that, that was the key. In his very first EuroLeague season, Rice was voted the MVP as Maccabi's miracle in Milan was completed by the lifting of the EuroLeague trophy for the first time in nine years.
it was just great for us to win, you know, as a team, being an underdog, you know, everybody riding us off and going out there and achieving something. It was amazing. It was something that I've never, you know, felt in my life to win two games in, what, four days or three days. You know, basically in dramatic fashion, both times was, you know, you couldn't ask for anything more than that. The action was fast and furious in top 16 round four. Let's take a look at the highlights now. Fenerbahce prevailed over Daru Shafaka, Lokomotiv overcame Panathinaikos, Serevita defeated Efes, and Cervena Zvezda stayed strong at home against Tunikaha. In Group E, Lokomotiv Kuban Krasnodar raced into an early lead before James Feldine and Vladimir Jankovic sparked Panathinaikos. After an intensely contested second half of several lead changes, it all came down to the final minute when Lokomotiv sank a late flurry of three-pointers, led by six from Dante Draper to march to victory. Sedevita faced Anadolu Efes for the third time this season and inside dominance from Miro Bilan gave the home team an early advantage. Derek Brown and Dario Saric kept Efes in contention and the game was tied with two minutes left. But Sedevita sank the key late baskets to hold home court. In a spectacular high-scoring local derby, Bobby Dixon hit five three-pointers in the first quarter to give Fenerbahce a sizable lead. 22 points from Luke Harangodi inspired a comeback for Daru Shafaka, but big nights from co-MVP Jan Vesely, who recorded a double-double, and Epe Udo were enough to help the visitors over the line after an exciting finale. Visiting Unicaja, Malaga put up a challenge behind playmaker Jamal Smith in Belgrade, but Cervena Zvezda took control towards the end of the first quarter and never let go. Four home players scoring in double figures were led by Stefan Jovic, who also dished five assists as Zvezda hit a flurry of late big shots to secure an ultimately comfortable victory. Fenerbahce maintains its record as the top 16's only unbeaten team to stay top of Group E. Lokomotiv moves into second with four teams tied for third place and Daru Shafaka still waiting for its first win. Barcelona won in Madrid, Laboral overcame Seska, Himki powered past Bamberg and Jalgiris trounced Olympiakos. In a thrilling Group F Clásico befitting the name, Real Madrid rapidly established a double-digit lead advantage behind fit again Sergio Yui and the mercurial Sergio Rodriguez, who finished with 18 points and 13 assists. But six triples from Justin Dolman brought Barcelona back into contention, and in a thrilling back-and-forth finale, Dolman sank a game-winner on the buzzer to seal a memorable road win. Seska Moscow travelled to Vitoria and Milos Teodosic led the visitors' challenge with 18 points, but outstanding weekly co-MVP Ioannis Borussis registered yet another double-double, his seventh of the season, to guide Laboral Kucha to an important home victory. Rosa Baskets kept it close in the first half as Bradley Wanamaker led his team's challenge, but one man took over in the second half. Alexei Sveds finished with 22 points, allowing Hinky Moscow to establish and then protect a big lead, which was never threatened in the final stages. And Jalgiris Kaunas marked Sarunas Yazikevicius's home coaching debut in fine style, holding Olympiakos to its fourth lowest points total this century, as Paulius Jankunas led the way with 18 points in the Lithuanian team's first top 16 victory. In a remarkably close group, Himki Moscow enjoys an outright lead over no less than six teams, sharing second place with two wins from four games.
Himki Moscow Region ace Alexei Shved had a big help in hand to kickstart his sporting career when he was young. He comes from a basketball crazy family and his father Victor was a coach who gave young Alexei all the skills he needed to succeed in the game and still does in these days. Yeah, like he teach me a lot and uh, I started playing basketball when I was six and uh, a lot of things what I can do. Uh, he teach me and uh, I have a basketball family. I have two more sisters and my mom there. Everybody play basketball. He's a great coach and uh, we have well, like I think four or five guys in Russia who play here now and he teach them too. So he's a great coach. He can learn young guys. Uh, he can show them a lot of moves and uh, for me he's the best coach. We have a basketball family and uh, we're always talking about basketball, like about my games or about other games. Uh, so, yeah, everybody loves basketball. <laughs> yeah, I'm always talking to them on the phone or FaceTime and sometimes they can say what I need to do, how I can play better or what I don't need to do, you know. Though he is a Turkish Airlines Euroleague rookie, swingman Corey Higgins has emerged as yet another serious weapon for perennial Final Four contender Seska Moscow. Midway through the season, Higgins is not only Seska's third best scorer at 11 points per game, but he is the most efficient three-point shooter still playing in the competition. Once when you know about Higgins' upbringing, however, his early Euroleague success is not such a surprise. Basketball was put in my hand uh, from a very young age, and uh, being that my father was a player, so um, it, it was almost like I was destined to be a ball player, and I was blessed to have him, and he showed me the ropes of uh, what it takes to become a good basketball player. Corey's father, Rod Higgins, played parts of 13 seasons in the NBA and was a teammate in Chicago of a young Michael Jordan. The two formed a bond, and when Corey was born a few years later, Jordan became his godfather. As such, throughout his childhood, Higgins spent a lot of time with Jordan and his family. I'm sure everybody would love to be um, associated with Michael Jordan. So um, growing up around him and getting to see his greatness, uh, his work ethic, and um, just being able to have a casual conversation like he was just a normal person, um, it was a huge blessing for me and uh, something that um, I'll always have with me. Amazingly enough, Jordan wasn't the only original dream teamer that taught young Corey about basketball. His father had spent most of his NBA playing career at Golden State and later served several seasons there as an executive, alongside close friend Chris Mullen, who also impacted Corey's view of basketball. I could take a little bit from every, everybody, and everybody had a different advice to give me, um, my father especially. Corey's biggest takeaways from the time he spent around the likes of Jordan and Mullen might not be what one would think. The biggest piece was just work ethic and uh, consistency, having to uh, do it every day. Uh, you don't just become great, it's a process, and um, I was blessed to have guys like obviously Michael Jordan and, and Chris Mullen uh, growing up who actually uh, Chris Mullen helped me work out during, a lot during high school and helped my game a lot so um, it's just something that you just can't take for granted and um, just a huge blessing. 
What was a blessing for him is now the same for Seska, as Higgins has become a part-time starter, shooting above 55% from the field and above 80% at the foul line. When you compare his points attempted to points scored, Higgins boasts the highest overall shooting accuracy among perimeter players in the entire EuroLeague. That may be because, even though he was influenced greatly by world-renowned legends, Higgins ultimately moulded his game in the shape of his father's. I think my game is a lot like comes from uh, my dad because he was a fundamental player. I'm not very flashy, I'm just fundamentals and um, know how to score in easy ways. So, um, so yeah, I think just growing around great players and learning the work ethic helped me uh, until now. Though separated by an ocean, Corey and Rod Higgins remain close. And whether he's struggling or playing great, he always knows his dad is there for him. I'm talking about my dad uh, every um, every couple of days. He's my biggest coach. He never stops critiquing my game. He's uh, my biggest fan and my big, biggest critic at the same time. After growing up surrounded by basketball legends and with a supportive father still giving guidance, it's little surprise that even as a EuroLeague rookie, Corey Higgins has emerged as such a powerful force for Seska. Top 16 round four saw two big men in the spotlight as Fenerbahce's Jan Vesely and Ioannis Borossis of Laboral Kucha shared the weekly MVP award after both amassing personal index rating of 30 in their team's impressive victories. On Thursday, Borossis led his team to a fantastic 81-71 home victory over Seska Moscow with his seventh double-double of the season. Borossis tallied 19 points after making nine of his 10 free throws. He also posted 13 rebounds and dished three assists to claim his second weekly MVP award of the season and the fifth of his career. A day later, Vesely was in typically spectacular form as Fenerbahce outlasted local rivals Darul Shafaka in a thrilling 100-106 victory. Vesely set the tone early on by scoring his team's first five points and he continued to dominate the boards, finishing with 16 points after converting seven of his nine two-point attempts. Vesely also pulled in 13 rebounds, as well as blocking a shot and registering an assist and drawing six fouls to claim the first MVP award of his 97-game EuroLeague career. Number five, Istanbul, Turkey. Early on, Fenerbahce with possession. Comes to Jan Vesely, Vesely spinning, misses the shot. Vesely with the rebound, and what a finish! Incredible slam dunk from the amazing Jan Vesely. Missed a shot, but more than made up for it with a foul. Number four, Belgrade, Serbia, final seconds of the first half. Sevenes Vesta trying to score, but there is a buzzer beating block by Jack Cooley for Unikaha Malaga. Number three, Istanbul, Turkey, Fenerbahce playmaker Bobby Dixon nearly loses it, picks it up and hurls it towards the basket and in! Incredible from Bobby Dixon, no wonder he's smiling. Nearly lost the ball, two seconds on the clock, almost a no-look triple. Number two, Vitoria, Spain. Laboral with the ball, but Milos Teodosic now on the fast break. Finds Corey Higgins! Unbelievable slam dunk from Corey Higgins. He knew Schengeli was going to try to block it. He went with authority. Number one, Madrid, Spain. It's El Clasico. Final seconds. Barcelona trailing by one. Justin Dolman takes on the shot and scores. Barcelona win the Clasico with the final shot of the game. On the buzzer, Justin Dolman. Top 16 round five is highlighted by a rematch of last season's final for a mouth-watering game of the week. While a fast-rising contender visits one of the most electrifying basketball atmospheres anywhere. 
in Group E. Fenerbahce, Istanbul and floor general Kostas Lukas will look to extend their perfect EuroLeague home record this season to eight games as they welcome Serevita Zagreb and former Fenerbahce big man Luka Zaric for a first time meeting between them. Another Group E encounter sees ambitious Lokomotiv Kuban Krasnodar and hard-charging Chris Singleton test themselves with a road trip to face the passionate fans of Servenas Vedsta Telecom Belgrade and another powerful presence in the paint, Mike Zirbes, as the home team seeks its first victory ever against the Russian visitors. Also in Group E, Panathinaikos welcomes Darul Shafaka to Athens, whilst Anadolu Efes travels to Unikaha Malaga. In Group F, the Game of the Week features two of the last three EuroLeague champions, both of whom had to beat the other in the championship game, as Real Madrid and Olympiakos Pireos renewed their rivalry in a showdown that features two former Final Four MVPs in Andres Nocioni and Vasilis Panoulis. Also in extremely competitive Group F, two traditional Spanish challengers go head-to-head -head as FC Barcelona's ever-dependable Brad Olison welcomes his former team, Laboral Cucha Vitaria Gasteis, and the live wire, Darius Adams. And Group F also sees a pair of games in Moscow as Seska welcomes Broza Baskets and Himki plays at home against Jalgiris Kaunas. We'll be back next week with more EuroLeague action.